any of us in here ever or recently got a newer car? It doesn't have to be a new car, but in the last couple of years got a newer, new vehicle? How many of us still got our old one? We're like, Lord, bless us with a new vehicle. Lord, I need to, this car is on his last leg. I was driving for uh, several years, I was driving this gray van that had been passed down. Uh, man, if you've, ever, if you've ever, you know, in high school, it's just brutal, you know? I mean, you're driving the wrong vehicle in high school, you just feel that's like social suicide, you know? So, uh, you know, this is one of those vehicles you park far away, it's this gray van, it's beat up, it's rough, it's like, it's on its last leg. I mean, you, you know, we pray for a lot of things to build our faith. I didn't know one of those things would be the van. Every time I'm driving, Lord, please just let me get from A to B, God. You are good. You are worthy. Play Hillsong. Hopefully that affects the car. I mean, <laughs> it's one of those vehicles. I, it's, it's, it's on its last leg. And uh, my mom bought a newer vehicle a couple years back. Not a new vehicle, but a newer vehicle. But man, this thing was, I think our van's like 2002. This was like a 2014. I don't know if you've ever gone from a car that's falling apart to a newer vehicle, but man, it is night and day. I mean, the first time I got in this car, I sat down, it's like adjusting the seats, got heated seats. I'm like, whoa, like cars actually do this? Like steering wheel, wow, you could, like things weren't falling apart. The car wasn't shaking when we got over 60. And I remember, but you know, my mom was like, Josiah, be careful. It's my new car. Be careful with it. Don't crash it. So now there's like an extra pressure, like, man, if I crash it, I have to call mom. going to get disowned from the family and just thrown out of the house. And so, so I, I remember driving the car for the first time. I was super nervous. Seatbelt on, got to the stoplight, like, you know, the stop sign, look left, look right, look left again, look right, just like triple checking you know, by the car, you know if you have a new car. Parking way at the end of the back of the lot, right? Because I'm not trusting any of these other drivers out here. You see a little smudge on it. You're like, you know, clean that off later. Standing next to your car extra long before you open the door. I mean, this was a nice, this was a nice, this was a change. When I think of the difference between my mom's vehicle and the my, the van that I had, I, I realized that because I valued one vehicle better than the other, I treated one better than the other. See, because I didn't value the van that much, and I was kind of like, ah, this is just some, you know, just van, piece of junk, falling apart, like, this thing is terrible, but this, whoo, treated it different, parked it way back cleaned it off, made sure I was double checked the van. I'm like, okay, you know, just kind of rolling through the stop sign. And See, what I realized as I processed it and thought about it a little bit is I thought that how we value things determines how we treat things. And although sometimes it's okay to value a vehicle different if it's kind of, it's a little junky and it's nice, that's one thing, but it's a totally different realm when we start valuing people differently because then we start treating people differently. I think all of us have felt a moment in our life where somebody judged us or acted in a certain way towards us based on some external feature that we represented to them, right? We've all felt that way before where you're at a certain location, maybe meeting a stranger and like, why are they treating me so nice? Oh, they think I have money. Mm. Or why are they treating me so bad? Oh, yeah, because I just like I got out of bed, like they're, these are my pajamas. See, I think there's a lot of different people and we realize how sometimes we can get treated differently because people value us differently, but I also believe that sometimes we treat people differently because we value them differently. I mean, that's part of our world. That's part of our society. We raise some people up and some people are really valuable based on their fame or their success or their last name and other people not so much. We kind of, you know, those are the nobodies, the people who didn't make it and we treat people differently based on how we value them. Not only do we treat others differently, which can damage relationships, hurt people, dishonor God, but sometimes we have a hard time even understanding our own worth 
Sometimes we have a problem understanding who we are and the worth and the value that God has given us. And because sometimes I've wrestled with this in the past, having problems with my own worth or my own value, and because I don't value myself how I should, I treat myself differently. When you don't value yourself, you can get depressed. When you don't really understand that you have worth and value, you say, man, what's the point of living? What's the point of this? When you don't value yourself. When you don't value yourself, you chase things because if I don't have value, I wanna get value or add value or build up value in my life. So if I don't feel valuable or feel like I have worth, then I go and chase worth and it's really from a core essence of you don't understand your own value that you're chasing to gain value someplace else. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with that aspect of value. But I believe that Genesis 1 teaches us about how to value people in the way that God values them. See, if how we value things affects how we treat things, then I wanna learn how to value things, how God values things, so that I can treat things in the right way. And I really believe that if we allow, if we allow this truth that's shared today from God's word to change the core essence, we really start realizing and understanding how God values people and how God values us, I believe that our lives would be completely different because we would live different. So I want you to join me in Genesis chapter one. I'm only gonna share two verses out of Genesis, but Genesis chapter one, I'm gonna read verses 26 and 27. To change the way we treat people, we need to learn to value how God values. So number one, the image of God shapes our worldview. Genesis 1, 26 says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So on the sixth day of creation, after God's created the universe and the water and separated land and water and the stars, the sixth day, God creates mankind. Now, God is finishing up his process of creating all the creatures that we read about in Noah's Ark, your little Noah's Ark book when you were young, right? You got the giraffe with the long neck, beautiful creature. You got the rhino with its horn, the eagle with its wings. I mean, go to the zoo, the beauty of creation. I mean, it shows God. Yet, there is no creature under the face of the sun that is like us humans. See, the difference between the chimp, the difference between the rhino, the difference between your dog and yourself is not just a physical difference, but God has created you in his own image and his own likeness. Humans are different and more excellent than all creation because no other creation is made in the image of God. So what does it mean to be made in the image or the likeness? I mean, that begs a question. Does it mean that I physically look like God? I remember when I was young, I used to think, well, you know, I read about in the Bible how God, you know, formed the world and hand, God's hands. I'm like, man, we're, we must be physical. But it's not a physical resemblance that we show God because God is spirit. But how we show God is in a couple different things. I'm gonna share one of them. One of them is that we are like God because that we, we have a soul. Now our soul is our self-conscious, our reason, our morals, free will, speech, and even emotions. Your soul is the essence of who you are as a person, your personality. There's three different parts to a human being. We believe from the Bible, we believe there's your body, your physical, how you relate to the world around you. We believe your, your soul, 
the essence of who you are as a person, a being. And then there's your spirit. And your spirit is the part of you that relates to God. So God has created you different. Part of, the, part of the difference between you and the rest of creation is God has given you a soul. One of those things of the soul under soul is reason. Human beings can think, form decisions, make judgments, use logic, and choose. I know one of the questions you're thinking in your mind right now is, but will my dog go to heaven? I'm not going to answer that question today. But we do think of our animals sometimes, right? You think of the animals in your home. How many of us here are dog people? How many of us are cat people? Listen, the Lord still loves you. He still, he still loves you. You're still loved by the Lord. It's okay. Sanctification takes a long time. We have a little dog in our home. Her name is Angel. Pretty often we say that she acts like the devil, but... Her name is Angel, my, my sister's dog. She's a little black and white shih tzu, you know, weighs about 11 pounds. She's 13 years old. And, you know, she, I, I can't say that creatures, like what I'm not saying is that creatures don't have minds and intelligence. Because if you know you have a pretty smart animal, man, my dog is pretty smart. My dog, where she sits in the house is she's in the front room. And uh, she's on the couch and she sits on the top of it. But the couch is a little high for her. And so she has, this is her pattern. She will move her body to kick the pillow off so that it hits the ground so that she can jump down. She will not jump down unless the pillow's there. So if the pillow's not there, she'll bark and she'll bark and you'll bark. My dog even can tell the difference somewhat between right, right and wrong. She knows that she does not go into my dad's office. My dad has these two glass doors, and so one can prop open, and she will get down on her paws and just stand right at the edge of where his carpet starts to his office and just look at him. But she will not cross that line because she knows she's not allowed to cross that line. She's gone to the bathroom in there far too many times. <laughs> Our dog is a smart dog. She's a pretty intelligent dog. She even learns from the habits of where, you know, the, where she can cross, where she can't cross, where her food is, where her treats are, how she can work grandpa to drop food for her. I mean, she's a pretty intelligent dog. Every once in a while, I'm like, man, we, got, we have a pretty smart dog. But the dog, my dog, or any creature in creation is nothing in comparison to how God has created you. Although the dog is intelligent, it doesn't even come close. You say, what about chimps? I've heard that chimps' DNA is like 98, 99% like humans' DNA. And what do you think about all that? I mean, are we really that close? And what would you say? Well, there's been tons and tons and tons of studies on chimps. And chimps are wonderful, beautiful creations of God. I love just watching the way they inhabit and they work with each other. There's even chimps that have been able to beat British, there was a chimp that beat a British memory master on rem memorizing a stack of 52 cards. This memory master, he beat him. That's how good the memory was of this chimp. But the chimp is not like a human. Listen to American psychologist David Premack. Humans command all cognitive abilities, and all of them are domain general. Whereas animals, by contrast, command very few abilities. And all of them are adaptations restricted to a single goal or activity. Here's the key. Humans, in other words, are, in, are, are a singular bright light in the dark intellectual firmament that is the rest of nature. See, what the psychologist is saying is, hey, listen, We've studied all the animals, but there is a distinction. There's some great animals that can do things that even we can't do. But when it comes to cognitive abilities, when it comes to your soul and your mind and the way you process things, the way you judge, the way you observe, there is no creature that even comes in comparison with a human being or humankind. See, God has created us distinct, special because we are made in his image. See, anytime a human invents a machine, builds a house, paints a painting, enjoys a symphony, calculates a sum, 
writes a paper, that person is proclaiming the fact that we are made in the image of God. Another part of our soul that separates us from animals is our morals. See, humanity, when we were created in the garden, humanity was created in righteousness and perfect innocence. We were created to be like God. Even the fact that we have a conscience right now that points to the remnant, it's a remnant pointing back to our original state that when we see something done wrong, we can say, well, I don't really know. No, we can tell if that's right or wrong because we have a conscience and that comes from God because God distinguishes what is good and what is evil. Anytime someone drafts a law, is repulsed at evil, praises good behavior, feels guilty, they are confirming the fact that we are made in God's image. It's not just our reason, it's, just, it's not just our morals, we're social as well. You know, even the most introverted person in this room, the person who said, ah, I, just, I really needed to recharge away from people. I, I'm okay being around people, but I just really need my alone time. I really, that's where I feel good. Even the most introverted person among us is still a social creature. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. See, when God was walking among Adam and Eve, God didn't just create them and say, hey, I'm gonna go leave. No, the Bible in Genesis says God walked among Adam and Eve. See, from the very beginning, God wanted a relationship with us as humans, and because God is a relational creature, guess what? We're a relational creature as well. See, God has created us in his image and likeness. We also have a spirit. That's our ability to relate with God. God is spirit. We also have dominion. God says, I gave humans dominion over all the rest of the creatures. The right to rule over all the land, above all the creatures. Some more powerful, some faster than us, yet God gave us a mind. See, what I'm trying to establish here is that God has created us different from every single creature, and God has created us in his image. God chose to make us in his image, and because God did this, humans are created with intrinsic value and worth. Because God has created us in his image, we have a worth above the rest of the creature, creatures in the creation. You are created differently. There's a difference between you and all the rest of creation. So not only does the image of God shape our worldview, but number two, and I'm gonna start getting really practical here. The image of God shapes our view of self. See, once we understand that our value is intrinsic and from God the creator, we start living differently. You know, when I look around the world, when I look around my friends, when I look around my peers, especially those that I know that don't know Jesus, but sometimes it seeps into the church as well. When I look around the world, I, I look and see so many people that are chasing after worth and value because they don't feel like they have any. And they feel like if I just had enough of this, if I just had enough success in my career, or if I just slept with enough people, or if I had this title before my name, then I would have worth and value. And God says, no, 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 you missed it. The value and the worth you have is intrinsic. It's given from me because I made you in my image. I remember the first time. I have very select memories in my mind that are very, very clear. But I remember the first time I realized that I could change my value based on external things. I remember I was young. I was in, I was in seventh or eighth grade. I was around there. And um, my cousin would always, you know, hand me down his clothes. And so he would buy all these clothes that I would never buy. And so he, I remember I had these ripped jeans, these Abercrombie ripped jeans. And it was like super cool. And I, I had this uh, Abercrombie shirt. I felt like, man, when I put this shirt on, this is nice. Now, up until this point, I had never viewed clothes really differently. 
It was eternal, like, I put a shirt on, put some pants on, go out and, you know, do my thing. I remember being at the Shedd Aquarium. I was with my dad. We were leaving the dolphin exhibit. I remember this so clearly. I was walking up the stairs, and I remember these two girls about my same age. They looked at me, and I, was kind of, I could tell, like, they were kind of feeling me, so I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm just kind of like, let's go. <laughs> you know, I remember these, these girls. I remember that moment. And uh, I saw them, they looked at me, I looked at them, kind of looked at each, smiled at each other, walked by. And I remember walking with my dad, and my conscience, my brain, my thought process is telling me, I learned in that moment that I can change the way people value me based on if I can change some external features. That was the moment for me, that I realized that, man, these, these girls weren't really super into me when I dressed kind of, you know, however I was dressing, but man, when I wear this certain type of clothing and I look a certain type of way, people treat me different. They value me different. Do you remember the moment in your life? Do you have a clear, distinct moment like me where you remember like this was a turning point where I realized that people will value and treat me differently if I have this? Is there a lie that you believe that plays in your mind that you're just not successful or you haven't made it or you don't have worth and value until you have this position, this career, this title in front of your name, this much education, till you have this person on your, uh, you, you, you could take this person out to date, but until you have this person or that person, until you're part of this family or you have this job or title, you don't have worth and value. See, one of the greatest lies that plays in our society on loop is that value is built up, not built in. See, I believe that society tells you have to earn your worth, you have to earn your value, and until you have these accolades and these accomplishments, until you've done something, you don't have worth, and until you've done it, then you have worth, and God says the complete opposite. God says, if you never did another thing in your life, you still have worth. Hey, listen, if you didn't have all those accomplishments and all those trophies, if you didn't have another dollar to your name and drive the nicest type of car, it doesn't matter who you date or who you marry, it doesn't matter what you look like on the inside or outside, that God says you still have value regardless if you have any of those things that the world prizes above and says these are the valuable and the worthy of society. I have to make people laugh, and when I laugh, then I'm valuable. So I form myself into a class clown because I want to be loved and valued by people. I need to drive a certain type of car, and it needs to be a certain type of year because if I drive anything else less than that, I'm not really valuable. I'm not really worthy. I'm not really somebody. I need to have this type of person on my shoulder, this type of person in my life. And if I'm, out, if I'm without a relationship and I don't have somebody to call me my boo or my own, then I missed it. I don't make a lot of money, so I'm a failure. My business went other. I'm not beautiful, and to be beautiful, that's who is valued in society. If I, I don't really have, I'm not really an Instagram model type of look, so I'm not valued, I'm not beautiful because I don't look like the posters look. I don't look like the magazines look like, so I don't really have value and purpose. I was downtown a couple years ago with my cousin, we went to the Art Institute. And, you know, my mom told me I was a pretty good artist growing up, but that's your mom, so you're kind of like, <laughs> probably wasn't, <laughs> like cramps, like, is this good, boy? She's like, yeah, it's great. You know, it's like just, just bad stuff, you know? But I always enjoyed art. I always enjoyed looking at art. And so I've been to like the Louvre in Paris and seen the, um, uh, what's the famous lady there? The Mona Lisa, listen. It's not all it's hyped up to be. <laughs> it's just a little picture on like a wall. You're like, wait, where is it? I can't see it. You know, lines behind it, bulletproof glass. But I enjoy art. I enjoy looking at these sculptures and these paintings. And there's some pieces of art that are my favorite pieces to look at. They, they speak to me. I, 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 I can look at the emotion that the artist painted with. And we have this renowned institute in our own city, the Art Institute. And so I went with my cousin a couple years ago and I was going through all these different rooms and looking at the Renaissance art and the Impressionism and 
uh, just the surrealism art that's really cool. And I was like, man, this is, these are some really cool pieces of artwork. And some of these are multi, multi-million dollar pieces of artwork. And then I, uh, you know, and how I look at, you know, how, I'm, how I am in an institute is I'm just kind of like real quick, you know, I'm just kind of like scanning. I'm not the person with the headphones on and like, and there's, there's 1974 and it was like this. Okay. I try to get through the whole thing. And so I went into this one room and I almost thought I was in like the wrong room because every painting on the wall just looked like it was a canvas that somebody took a bucket of paint and just threw it on. And then they took like five other buckets of paint and kind of threw it, put a splatter on it, like art. And I was looking around like, what is this art called? Because this is like, I, I can do this. If this is like what it means to be an artist in some million dollar paintings, like sign me up because I can throw a bucket of paint at a wall and call it art. And, uh, you know, some of these pieces I was looking at one after another, they all look similar, but they're different colors. But it really just looks like a toddler took paint and just threw it on there. And yet some of these paintings are worth hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars for a painting. I'm like, really? I could do that at home? Like, really? That's that special? But you know what made the art valuable? What made the art valuable was not my opinion of the piece of art or even the wall it was on or the canvas. What made the art so valuable, worth hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, wasn't even the paint that was used on the canvas. What made the art valuable is the artist behind the painting. Can I tell you the artist who is the artist behind the creation of you, your mind, your heart, who you are as a person? Psalms 139, 13 and 14 says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You aren't just a product of your parents. See, you were formed, knit, crafted together by the greatest mind in the universe, that God Almighty himself took his time in making you, put you together. And sometimes we look at ourselves in the mirror and we hate the reflection. We say, how can I be that? Or we reflect like, how am I missing my accomplishment? I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And God says, no, 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 that's exactly how I made you. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not valuable, that you're not worthy, that you messed up because God's saying, I've given you intrinsic worth and value. See, God doesn't make mistakes. He only makes masterpieces. And God has made a masterpiece out of every single person in here. That you have value and worth, that you are different than the person sitting next to you. You think differently than the person sitting next to you. That God has crafted you, made you, knit you just the way you are. And guess what? Our God is a God of perfection. He does not make mistakes. See, God created every person unique, special, and different. You know, we live differently. This is the, the theme. We live differently when we value differently. There's some of you in this room right now, you're sitting in a seat, you're listening to the message, but you are spending every minute and every second of every hour trying to get worth and value from other people that are around you by trying to work hard enough, by trying to buy enough houses, by trying to get enough money in your bank account, by trying to get enough education so you can have the 10th title you have because you feel like if I cross this mark, then I'll have value and worth. And you're living your life trying to get worth and value. Even people who have been walking with the Lord can believe the lie that, yeah, God's forgiven me and God saved me, but I really don't have worth until I have this. You meet people all the time in your life who don't see worth in themselves, right? There's enough teens around the city cutting their wrists because they're depressed and they don't see a worth and value in who they are. There's enough people who commit suicide every year because they don't see the worth and the value of themselves and so they'd rather just blow their brains out to end their life instead of moving forward, instead of understanding that God has created them unique. God has created them different. 
God has created them with purpose. I'm sick of running into women who just chase after the next guy, the next guy, because there's an emptiness in their heart that they're trying to fill, a brokenness there, and they just think, if I just sleep with the next guy, if I just have this guy with me, then I'll feel like I have worth and value. Or a guy who feels the same way about women, if I just have this many notches on my belt, then I'll feel like I have worth and value. See, we live differently when we understand our worth before an almighty creator. When you understand your worth and the value that's been given to you intrinsically to you by God, that it's not something you have to work for, but he's giving to, given it to you, it's built into the fabrics of who you are, worth and value, you live differently. Hey, when you value yourself, you treat your body differently. When you learn that other people have value as well, you treat others differently. What we need is we need people to help start understanding their worth and their value before a holy and righteous God who's created them. I was trying to plug my phone in. My phone was dying two weeks ago. And I was in my kitchen and I was looking for an outlet to plug it in. And I didn't know any of the outlets weren't working in our house. But I took my phone, I took the cable, I plugged it in, and I went in the kitchen, I plugged it in, wasn't charging. 3%, 3% it's dying. Put it in the outlet next to it, didn't charge. I go, oh man, what's going on here? It's my phone? And so I was like, man, maybe the cable wasn't plugged. So I took it, I plugged it into three or four outlets, none of them were working. And the power was on, the lights were on. Like, what in the world is going on? So I thought maybe it was my cable. I reset my phone. I kept trying to figure out, like, what was going on with my phone? And so I started to think that the cable was broken, that the cable was messed up, and that's why my phone wasn't charging. I would have to buy a new cable. But I decided to try one more time. And so I went to the outlet that wasn't being used, and I went in the bathroom. And I opened the door, and there's an outlet right to the left, and I plugged my phone in, and my, my phone started charging. You know, the problem wasn't my phone. The problem wasn't my charger. The problem was the source. And see, a lot of us, our problem is not that it's you. It's not that you're wrong or you don't have worth and value. It's the source at who you're going to to ask if you have value or worth. See, a lot of us are going to the wrong source. And we're plugging in and realizing why there's no power, why there's no change in my life, why am I living so purposeless? It's because you're plugged into people's worth and value about you, their opinions that are being plugged into God. If you try, if people are your source, if people are your source of worth and value, that you're gonna live a roller coaster of a life. Because guess what? People's opinions change. I talk to people all the time who have one opinion of one artist and it changes the next week. You know, I kind of like their music. It's like people's opinions are constantly changing. And so if you're trying to live to an opinion that's constantly changing, you're gonna end up morphing and disfiguring yourself to be somebody that you're not. And you look in the mirror one day and you're not even somebody that you like. You're trying to be liked and valued and worthy in the eyes of somebody else. And ultimately, God is saying, listen, stop looking to other people to be valued and to be affirmed and to find your worth. Go to me, God. <laughs> because God values us differently. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, I want someone like that to give me value and worth. I don't want you to base it on how I look or how I dress or the skin, skin color on my skin, how many, uh, what kind of car I drive or what I've accomplished with my life. I want to be given worth by someone who's not judging me on my outward appearance or my external accomplishments. I want someone to give me value and worth who sees my heart and who I am at the core essence of who I am. <laughs> oh, 
All the things that give you value before men mean nothing before God. You know what I fear sometimes is that not, not only in my own life, but there'll be some of us Christians who stand before God one day and you're at his throne, you lived your life, it's over, the door is closed, and God will say, well, you know, why did you spend so much time getting six houses? Why did you spend so much time trying to buy the boat? Why did you spend so much time working at your career? All your life was poured into your career. Why did you spend so much time doing one thing after another? And God's gonna say, you were spending all this time and energy to try to feel worthy and valued in the eyes of other people. And I already told you, do you have worth and value? That's what I fear one day, is that some of the things that I'm really living for are motives of me really trying to find worth and value in things that ultimately don't define my worth and my value. Our worth and value doesn't come from what we've done. They come from what he's done. It doesn't come from what you've done. You can work day after day and slave away for the approval of your father. You can work day after day after day, try to get the approval of your boss. You can slave your life away working and trying to get the corporate position of vice president or CEO because you dreamed of it. And once you have this height, once you have this power, then you'll feel, you'll feel worthy and valuable. Then you'll feel like you've made it, you're somebody. And God says, listen, your value doesn't come from what you've done. It comes from what I've already done. And I've already made you in my image. I've already made you in my likeness. When we start understanding that God has given us intrinsic value and worth, we stop chasing after value and worth in all these empty places, and we start living differently. Third and last, the image of God shapes our view of others. You know, well, we've all had these experiences where we felt like somebody treated us differently. Sometimes they tell you, yeah, it's because your skin color. Yeah, it's because you look a certain way. I kind of like, I didn't think, I thought you were, you know, homeless or something. So you're just like, really? Like, this is the in style tipster to have ripped jeans and stuff. I remember when I traveled to, um, I traveled to Spain and then Ecuador. And when I went to Spain, it was my family and one of my buddies. And my mom's pre, I don't know if I look Mexican, I'm confused. But my mom looks Mexican. And my buddy that I brought along, real good friend, both his parents are Mexican. And when we went into Spain, Spain's all pretty much lighter skin. They took him out of our family, stopped him, and brought him through an extra security check and he's like, no, 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 I'm with them. They're like, no, 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 come over here. You're with us. Purely, purely on his skin color, purely on his last name. They just took him like, yeah, you look like you're trying to get smuggled in the country. Get over here. We're going to put you to the extra test. We were joking and laughing about it on the, way, on the way to my grandma's house and all this. In Ecuador, we went on a trip with the same guy. It was me and my dad, a buddy, and another buddy. And uh, they're both, they both look really Hispanic. And me and my dad, once again, we don't. We went into the country and we're going through the security. We're basically out of the airport. We're just arriving in Ecuador. And they pull me and my dad like, yeah, we want the two white guys that look like drug dealers. Yeah, can you guys come with us? You guys definitely aren't supposed to be here. Can you guys go through this extra security? We're like, wow, like, what is this based on? Like, they're definitely just singling me out because I don't look like the rest of the people here. There's experiences like that where people look at you and they perceive you to be different. They look at you and they make assumptions. They look at you and you may, they make judgments. And we can't stand when it's done to us, right? We feel like, how could you, especially if it's with ill intent, how could you make that opinion? How could you say that? How could you treat me in that way just based upon how I'm dressed or how I look or what kind of car I drive? I, why are you treating me like that? Sometimes that has to do with our clothes, our looks, our car, skin color, job, family. But just as much as we can't stand when it's done to us, we so easily do it to other people, right? James 2, 1 through 4, you say, oh, no, Josiah, pastor, that only happens outside the church when people judge like that. Really? Yeah, no, 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 that just, 
you know, people just, they, they, like the Christian man, everyone loves each other, but like outside, that's where they're judging and making opinions. But like in the church, like, I'm like, have you been in the church recently? Have you been a Christian for a while? See, James knew this was a problem, so he, he talks to us about the problem real quick. He says, James chapter two, he says, my brothers and sisters, who's he speaking to? The church. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here, here's a seat for you. But you say to the poor man, hey, you, you stand there in the back or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? What is favoritism? Favoritism is looking at two different people or two different groups of people and saying, well, this person, because they have X, Y, and Z, this person is more valuable than this person because they don't have X, Y, and Z. And not only do you make the, the judgment in your mind to value them differently, but you treat them differently. God's saying, hey, listen, that is actually sin. That's actually sin. And he says, it's happening among you. He's saying it's happening within the church that you guys are judging people based on their economic status, based on their skin color, based on how they look, how they act. You're, you're judging people based on their apparent external things. And, and what James is saying, listen, that is wrong in the eyes of God the creator. He's saying we've actually taken a position we're not supposed to take. He said, you've taken the position of being a judge. You've taken the position of a judge with an evil thought. He says, a judge with evil thoughts mean improper standing, which leads to show special attention to some people based on their external appearance or what they have rather than their real worth. You say, well, is it just Christians we're supposed to treat right? Is it just Christians that we're supposed to treat you know, how God wants us to treat. I, a brother shared this verse with me. It was just really convicting. Proverbs 14, 31 says, whoever, listen to this, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. That's not even talking about believers. That's talking about people in general, humans, how we're supposed to treat them. That when we treat somebody wrong because they're homeless or they're poor, they don't have a lot, or we, they're, they're weird socially and we just avoid them. When we treat people wrong, it says we are dishonoring our maker, our creator, your savior. You're dishonoring Jesus. See, when we value people over other people, we end up treating them different and we dishonor the God that created them with value and worth. One of the most convicting verses I've read, it's in Matthew chapter five. And he says, it's talking about the end of life when we're at the end, when we're before the throne. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Listen to this. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Do you understand what the ha what's happening here? God's sitting on his throne talking to people, talking to believers specifically. And he's saying, hey, listen, thank you for being there when I was in prison. Thank you for clothing me when I had no clothes. Thank you for feeding me when I was hungry. Thank you for being there when I was sick. And in the following verses, they say, when did we do that, Lord? When did I go visit you in prison? When did I feed you when you were hungry? When did I help you when you were in need? 
When did I clothe you when you were without clothes? And Jesus says this, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Wow. I mean, do you ever just read the Bible and get convicted anymore? Do you ever turn to the Bible and you're like, wow, wow, the way that I treat people is a direct correlation between how I treat people and how I treat God. That if I treat a believer in the wrong way, I am treating God in the wrong way. And when I treat a believer in the right way, I go out of my way to love them and to sacrifice, to give to them when they're in their need, to clothe them when they don't have clothes, to visit them in prison, then it's exactly as if I'm doing it for Jesus Christ himself. Guess why? Because we are the representation and the image of God. I've shared this story before, but at the 30th year anniversary, the 25th or the 30th, I ran into a guy. I was in a circle with some people, and I had a guy come up to me, tall, six foot, four, five, tall, lengthy guy, older, maybe in his late 50s, maybe, maybe older. And he came up to our group, and he comes up to me, and he goes, hey, I know you. And then he turns, like, it's, like he, he's like, he moves like this. And then he turns and he sticks his tongue out like. And I was just like, that is weird. <laughs> in the back of my mind, I'm like, he's probably from one of those other New Life locations. Oh, yeah, I got, I got. <laughs> Comes a couple weeks fly by and I'm preaching on stage. And uh, this guy comes up to me and it's the same guy. He's moving like this, same thing, real strange, real tall guy, and he moves like this when you talk to him. He takes his pauses and moves like this, and you're, it's just strange. And I'm like, I don't really, he's kind of awkward. He's, his body's weird. I don't really want to be around this dude. And so I remember, I, I, first of all, I was like, oh, wow, he's from Midway. And then second, I was just kind of, like, I don't have time for this guy. Like, I can talk with other people. I don't really have time and energy to, to talk with this guy. Like, I ultimately what I was doing is I, this guy doesn't have really have worth and value in my mind. Like I, he's not somebody I would associate with, so I'm just not going to associate with him. And I kind of just cut the conversation short. Like, I don't remember, like, hey, you know, good to see you. I'll pray for you. You know, just kind of cut it short. Like didn't, didn't show any interest in his life. Didn't dig in at all. Didn't really care. And, and, and kind of, I walked away and I felt super convicted. I felt super convicted by God. And God says, how you treat him is how you treat me. I was like, wow, how I treat the Christians, how I treat the rest of the world, man, that's a, there's, there's a connection between how I treat people and how I treat God. And I just blew off Jesus. If Jesus was standing in front of me, I'd give him my ear. I'd sit down at his feet. I'd, what do you got to say, Jesus? What can I learn from you? And God had created such a beautiful, intricate creature, and yet I really wanted nothing to do with it because I didn't see the value that God had placed upon it. I got super convicted, and I, a couple weeks later, I, I just started pursuing him. Hey, good to see you. How you doing? First conversations are weird because I'm, like, feeling this dude out. Like, I just, what's going on here? He goes to tell me he has this disease that forces his body to not be able to control anymore. And I start talking to him, find out he's been a teacher, been in the military, he has kids, that he loves Jesus. And I just started getting to know him, a genuine interest in who this dude was, like just getting to know him at the core essence of who he was, like Jesus, teach me how to love this guy who I wouldn't associate with, teach me to love this guy, teach me to value this guy. And I started just caring about him and loving him. And he played, he did, he was part of the Easter play one or two years ago. And he was supposed to play a role, and he died. He died after playing one of the roles. And I think, man, he was such an incredible, incredible person that I blew off because of some external factors and just feeling like, I can't relate with him. We're not the same type of people. 
I, you know, I judged him based on his appearance, how he acted, and I kept myself from it. I thought, man, how many people do we walk by because we judge them and God has given them value? God has created them with love. God has knit them in his womb that they're interesting, creative, beautiful people, and we blow them off. We push them to the side. We don't give them a minute of our day because we've judged them based on how they look or how they act or what they have, and we'll give people who are 10 times more shallow, who have 10 times more things, 10 more minutes of our day, hours, because they're different. I said, God, forgive me. God, forgive me for devaluing some people and valuing some people over. God, forgive me for showing more worth to some people than, than to others. God, forgive me for treating people in a way that is not honoring to your throne and is not honoring to your name. Forgive me, God. And in our fallen nature, I would have kept treating him in the same way. I would have never changed. In my broken state, I wouldn't have batted an eye and I would have moved forward. But you know what? That's why there's Jesus. Because in Colossians 3, 9 and 10 says, do not lie to one another. Do not lie to one another since you have taken off the old self with its practices and put on the new self and have put on the new self and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. See, that's why we need Jesus, because we are made with the image of God, but we're marred, we're disfigured, we're broken, but Jesus heals it. Jesus glues us back together. Jesus holds it all. Jesus changes our broken, skewed hearts and minds to love people how he loves them, to value people how he values them, to care about people how he cares about people, to show kindness how he shows kindness because it's not me, but God is creating in us through his Holy Spirit, children of his who are called to be righteous and holy, set apart to him. And that happens when you surrender your knee and bow down to the cross and say, Jesus, I am broken, but you are the great fixer. Jesus, I am, the, I am broken, but you are the great healer. Jesus, I've messed up all my relationships. I treat people in the wrong way. I degrade them and devalue them. But Jesus, would you change my heart so that I can love people and treat them in the way how you, with, with value and worth and dignity, the way that you've called me to treat them with. God, would you change my heart and my mind? And God changes our heart and our mind through the blood of Jesus and with his Holy Spirit.